Just wanted to greet everybody and welcome you to this month's Mother of All Demo Days meeting. For those who are new here or haven't attended in a while, once every month, the Starfleet Endress teams get together to share their project progress in the format of a demo, hence the Mother of All Demo Days. This is also an opportunity for those in the community to share their own projects. So first off, we have an appearance from the PL Network CryptoSat. Amir, are you ready to present? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um... Amir, uh, I'm a project manager at CryptoSat. Um, and what we do is that we build trust infrastructure uh, for, for Web3. Um, and we we do that by la launching satellites that are able to run cri cryptographic uh, computations. Um, and before we get into that, we just very, very proud to, to share uh, the, the launches of our two satellites. Um, the first one was of May of last year, almost exactly one year. Um, and the second launch um, happened this January. So, so now we have two satellites in, in space that are able to do re really cool things for uh, web three applications. This is a little, a little, bit, a little bit of our, our, our milestone. Uh, one recent thing that we're pretty proud of is that we participated uh, in the KZG ceremony uh, this April, um, the, the, the Ethereum KZG ceremony. Um, what this means is that we got our our, contri our, our contribution uh, from our satellite and then sent it back uh, to the sequencer. A little bit about the architecture. Essentially, th these are CubeSats. So these are very small boxes that can fit on, on your desk. Um, after we launch them into space, uh, we're essentially able to provide a pretty standard REST API through our, our, our AWS infrastructure um, that is responsible for communicating with the satellites um, and making sure that your, your requests are uh, responded to. And with, with that in mind, I think we're ready to jump into the demo. This is the crypto set. Uh, simulator. Uh, what this does is sh sh show us where where our satellites are in in relation uh, to to Earth. These are low Earth orbit satellites, um, so essentially they change sometimes depending on on the, the time of day. So they have to be in range of a ground station for us to be able to communicate with them. That's obviously something that. A lot, a lot of users are, are thinking about before being able to adopt this in production environments. Um, and that's also something that we are always improving based on launching new satellites. Our next launch is scheduled for, for this year. And also with every launch, we also improve our capability to communicate with the satellites. Um, you know, since this is, uh, our, our company is called CryptoSat. I think the first thing that people are interested in is, you know, what is the 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 way to communicate with the satellite? So, a uh, first way to know that you're communicating with the satellite, and not with anything else, is using the CryptoSat uh, public keys. Um, this is a, a key that it, that anything that is provided uh, by a satellite will, will be signed with. Um, if, if we can. You know, I can also present it in a better way. This is a public key. Um, if we want uh, to, to verify, and we will in, in the next section, that this is how we verify that what uh, was provided to us was actually signed by the satellite. I should have mentioned before that th this is a key that was generated in space. So we it was, it was never on Earth once the satellite gets launched. We run a, uh, a key page generation. We publish only the, the public key, so the so the private key was never on Earth and never will be. This is a pretty simple example. Um, the idea being that you know, if you want uh, a timestamp for, 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 for the satellite, the satellite check of its own time, um, it, it will return it, and you, you can also ver verify that the timestamp that you received was in fact uh, created by the satellite or sent by the satellite. A next use case that uh, is, is recently we've seen some interest in is 
you know, your standard randomness, you, you probably heard, heard of TTRAND. Um, the idea here is that you can request um, a public random number from, from DRAND, uh, so sorry, <laughs> from CryptoSat, um, and then ver verify that indeed this was, uh, you know, a random number that was generated by the satellite. Here we're talking about a different flow where you it'll be a private num random number. Essentially, how this would work is um, you would create a client, you would create a, a key pair uh, on your on your computer. You would give the satellite the public key, and and the satellite will encrypt the timestamp with the the the, the random number with your uh, public key. So only you have access to that random number. So pretty long flow, so in the sake of time, I will skip through it. Um, this is a demonstration on, on how the satellite can sign messages on behalf of, of, of users, um, pretty similar to what we said before. Um, a, a, a nice use case here is the telling encryption. If, if, if you have ever thought about like seal bit option, for example, this is where this could be a, a interesting use case. The ability to create um, a a key pair, publish the, the, the public key. Everyone can encrypt um, their bids uh, before the time uh, expires, and 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 then once the time expires, uh, the, the, the private key will, will, will be released, and the results of the the auction will be out. We also have a uh, a uh, Discord where we do a little bit more like debugging for people that that you know they're, they're trying to use it, um, but they need some help. For example, um, that's a great place to go. Um, and, and obviously, uh, we're, we're we're on like Twitter and, and LinkedIn too. So um, I'll share all the all the the info um, right after the demo. Awesome. Looking forward to seeing all that information. Uh, moving on, uh, we have Ivan with Bedrock IPNI. Okay, so I, I want to like um, tell a super quick story about um, the recent enhancements that we've done to um, IPNI. Um, that uh, is a major improvement for the for the user privacy story. So let's first like recap what IPNI is. So IPNI stands for Interplanetary Network Indexer. So what it can be used for? So it can be used for finding content on uh, IPFS and uh, Filecoin networks. Um, so uh, it's a uh, it's used in a, in a bunch of uh, services already in a bunch of projects that I will uh, go through uh, go through in a minute. Basically, the main purpose of IPNI is you give me content identifier, I tell you where content behind that identifier can be found at. So, uh, and um, so like before going through the uh, recent improvements, so let me uh, just quickly recap how uh, IPNI works. So it can be uh, explained in four simple steps. So first step is, um, uh, we do have like a bunch of uh, Filecoin and IPFS nodes that are connected to IPNI. So, and they, whenever they have a new data, they post announcements. So that's step number one. So whenever new data appears on the IPFS or Filecoin nodes, they post announcements to the uh, lib via the lib P2P pub sub topic. So IPNI is continuously listening for those announcements. And whenever it picks up one, it would reach out to the uh, to that node directly to the storage provider and would fetch all the um, all the recent updates from it. So the unit of update is we call it advertisement. So basically, an advertisement is a unit of um, uh, is, a, is a is a structure that contains a list of content identifiers in it. So by announcing advertisements, you tell the IPNI that okay, I do have these CADs available at my node. So IPNI would fetch it, index it, and uh, that's it. So then after uh, the content is indexed, so a user would can use it to look up uh, some data. So when 
uh, user sends uh, user would send content identifier uh, request to a uh, request with content identifier to API, and API would return it. Hopefully, a list of providers where the data can be fetched from, and then the user would uh, would go or would reach out to these providers separately and download the uh, receive the data and uh, download the cat picture. So why API is awesome? So it's uh, awesome because it has two properties. It's a uh, uh, open protocol, so anyone can can run an API instance. Anyone can participate in it. However, it can be run as a centralized service, and running it as a centralized service provides some advantages. Specifically, the advantage is that it can significantly helps reduce time to first byte for uh, in the in the general content retrieval story. So one can find uh, content on IPFS and file coin networks much much uh, much much quicker. So what the problems we tackled with the uh, with the uh, privacy upgrade? Uh, there, there are two issues with the with the record, how API and I uh, is used right now. So uh, let's start with the uh, with the number one. So if if there is a man in the middle that observes user to API and I traffic, so they can see in open what content identifies the user is after, and they can just spy on the uh, lookup responses to the to the user. And uh, they can just reach out to the same storage providers and download the same data. And by doing that, they can spy on what data is user after. So the second attack vector is the rogue uh, IPNI deployment itself. So if uh, IPNI deployment is malicious, uh, someone can just it can just like spy on the request it receives and also can see what what data the users uh, the users is after. So and this is obviously not good. So uh, the way we tackled it is with recent upgrade to our previous story, which is called double hashing. So what is double hashing? So uh, in a simple words, without going to any details, so inst now instead of like uh, uh, providing, uh, looking up raw data in API in open, so instead of like using raw content, content identifier, the user would use hash over there, this content identifier. Mm -hmm. And in response, API would send a provide the records, which is encrypted with the original value of the content identifier. So what this means, that in order to make sense of such communication, if someone is spying on the users, uh, uh, one needs to know the original original content identifier, but the content identifier is gets never revealed in the, in the first place during such uh, communication rounds. So that enables much better privacy story for the, uh, for our users. So uh, double hashing is already running in fraud. So uh, we're running a big API deployment, which is called seed.contact. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, right now how the encrypted responses look like. So, so the one I have uh, open here is the uh, regular response. So if I, I can send a request to seed.contact, if you see in my browser, and it will respond me a bunch of the records where the Content behind that uh, content identifier can be found as so th th it's essentially a list of uh, providers with their lipid identities, their addresses. So I can just go through through this list, establish connection, download the data. So if I do a uh, encrypted lookup, so instead of re returning uh, data in open, it returns obfuscated, uh, uh, gets obfuscated data that I cannot make any sense of without knowing the original content identifier. So if I don't know it in the first place, then I cannot decrypt the, uh, decrypt the provider records and I cannot spy on the on others' communications. But next steps for us is to finish roll out to seed.contact. So currently we cover about 80% of the, of the lookup requests and this number is growing. So we need to update the uh, existing clients. So uh, uh, IPNI and i is, uh, is used by a bunch of different projects, such as LASI, uh, which is the Filecoin retrieval client, such as Kubo, which is uh, the most popular um, IPFS implementation. So it's used by uh, Decentralized CDN like Saturn. It's used, uh, well, yeah, it's a lot of places. So basically, we need to update the existing clients and existing integrations so that they use double hashing by default, so they don't send regular lookups anymore. So we need to work on the so-called rights of privacy upgrade. So rights of privacy would 
uh, allow publishers to advertise encrypted data into IPNI. Right now, this data is still in open, so we're protecting on the user privacy of the miners. Um, and yeah, uh, that would hopefully make IPNI even more awesome and even more usable. So, and if you have any questions, any suggestions, or you want to use IPNI, or like you want to ask something, please reach out to the IPNI Slack channel on the Filecoin Slack. Uh, yeah, and that's it from me. So thank you a lot for listening. Thank you so much, Ivan. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, moving on, we have Akosh with Consensus Lab. So oh, hello, everyone. My name is Akosh, and I'm here to present uh, what I've been working on in the last few months, which is to run FVM inside Tendermint as an alternative uh, node provider instead of Lotus. So this is part of the interplanetary consensus or what used to be hierarchical consensus effort which is kind of a recursive side chains organized under the filecoin root net and because we can't use the same consensus as expected consensus because you know storage you shouldn't be reusing it i suppose this is um we need a, a different consensus and one thing we use is as a fork of Lotus, which we call UD coin. You've probably seen it many times presented by Alfonso. And the other one is, is this Fender Mint, which is an off-the-shelf Fender Mint with FPM put in it. So it's um, all Rust, what I code, but Fender Mint calls me. So for anyone who isn't too familiar with Fender Mint, it's a proof of stake PFT protocol. And there is a, a generic component called Fender Mint Core. Now, renamed or you know um successed by succeeded by comet bft and it's very convenient from a developer's perspective because blocks are instantly final you're only moving forward never have to worry about unrolling you know rolling back your state it's very easy to think about but it doesn't scale to thousands of validators so you have to be uh, somehow sampling or or letting people to opt into a subnet and uh, around 100 validators can run it. And they're nice uh, Rust libraries. But what um, always comes with this is that the Cosmos SDK, so the Tendermint is the, is the bedrock of the Cosmos ecosystem. We are not using the Cosmos SDK because the Cosmos SDK is, is like these reusable modules of accounts and banking and transfer and transaction. Instead, we are having the built-in actors and the FVM that we use in Lotus. So that completely replaces it. Um, this is the life cycle of an application. So I'm the application tenderment calls me, and this is the life cycle of how a block is, is given and fed to the application. So you get a header, then for each transaction, you get a deliver. At the end, you get to change the power table, which is the next set of validators who can run or produce blocks. And finally, it tells you to commit the changes to the database so next time we, we all have to remember but it has other methods to run the genesis to check transactions that have been added to the mempool and all this exists without tendermint having any notion of what a transaction is so in the tutorial it's just key value pairs but in our case it's going to be our stuff and we will use the fvm to to interpret these so there is two it's it's an evolving standard. So there is this thing, ABCI++, which at the moment adds two very important methods to, for us, which is which allows us to uh, inspect the transactions that are going to be in the next block and inspect them again before we cast a vote on this block, which are going to be very useful functions for us to move into the hand and to replacing like full-blown messages with CIDs because CIDs are not immediately available like the previous fantastic uh, presentation showed that you you can have a CID but you, you have to be able to look it up somewhere and it's not something you can just trust so a fundament itself this is kind of the architecture you have lotus in the in the top and then some kind of nodes with three layers pushing messages between the no these nodes and uh, tendermint code is one process that I'm we have to run and then the fandermint process is another one and because it's another process we have complete freedom in, in how we deal with data so we can use IPLD tendermint is not enforcing it not even providing us with any storage so that's completely on us and we can also do our own network communication because it's we are not 
restricted to like Vasm or anything. You can do anything you want. Um, so effectively, they are a proof of stake sidechain, and which with a potentially more child child, child subnets under us. So we have two important aspects. One is absorb, observing our parent. The, these are top down messages coming from the parent, and we need to know when they are final before everybody applies it on the side chain. And we have to agree that the bottom of messages are available. So if if someone sends us a, a checkpoint, because that's how we propagate information up and down, then the parent validators who are not running the sub the sub chain, the side chain, can only apply this checkpoint once they understand that most of the majority of them will do so and they have the data. So even though maybe one of them don't have it, but this time they can retrieve it from their own bodies and it's it's uh, it's gonna work out fine. So checkpoints are one of these examples where you have it can be any anything you know the size can be anything because like you can imagine that uh, for the root you have massive number of subnets potentially under it and they have to go through if they have to go through the root to send each other messages you know how many there's gonna be it's difficult to tell up front so so we thought that the, well definitely a checkpoint can only contain a cid to, to some kind of list of messages and we don't know how many there's gonna be so there's many two options one you send some commitment and then you feed messages one by one or like the previous uh, presentation the ipni said that you can advertise that you have it or you know advertise that you you are able to serve anything from the subnet send the cid and let the notes come to you and for this to work there is just this just two-phase publishing the first we publish the intent for the checkpoint to be included in the blockchain but not for execution because they don't have it and then let the parent validators get it and then vote again that they have it and that's when it gets executed and this is when these abci plus plus methods are important for this we implemented this resolver which is somewhat similar to ip and i i think with gossip sub and bit swap to resolve content from anyone in any subnet and and with that this is the architecture that you have your abci application which is fendermint you have you see bytes because that's what a, a transaction looks like for tendermint and then you via these stack of interpreters refine it into more and more into messages that are more and more close to what the fem can actually handle so this might be a cid then we hand it over to a, a pool to the iprd resolver where it can get it back from the network and then next time if it has it it can just go through the to the fem uh, we have a roadmap, but uh, the green means here that it's done. So we are less than halfway through our roadmap. And this is, at this stage, it's just FEM plus IPRD. And um, all this demo that I did is like available on the on the website, on, on the repo website. It's like 50 minutes. So I'm just now it's a very truncated version, but there is a CLI and an RPC client. And that's what I just I just wanted to show you here. So I I have a demo script that's checked in. It, it goes through the steps of setting up a Genesis file. And um, so we can have a quick look at that. It's, it's the Genesis of um, of Tendermint actually. So if you just run it run this quickly, then it it has a, a sec it has sections for like its own consensus. Nobody's interested, and then we have our own genesis we can't use lotuses it's it's it, we don't run the full lotus we don't run markets unless people want us to run markets but it has its own accounts and uh, single validator because it's going to be a standalone setup so in these right two um, terminals in the top i'm going to start the pandemic process and in the bottom i'm going to start tendermint and it's going to here it says that uh, we are going through the genesis phase and it's, it takes some time because the vasm needs to be loaded but now it now you can see it's uh running blocks so with that i can go back to my my other scripts i have created some keys so i have alice and bob i can 
and for those of you familiar with the FEM, this is like the state. I can I have the CLI to ask like what's the state of an actor, and it will tell me the balance and the what kind of uh, code like EVM or account it is, and what's the current state. And then we can do transfers. Let's just do a quick transfer, just so the other other things check out. So here. There was a transfer. So now, if I ask Bob's balance, it shows that Bob now has a thousand um, tokens because that's what the transfer did. And then we can deploy Fabum contracts with this. So that one deployed a Fabum contract and returned to me this um, bunch of addresses. So this is like the delegated address, which we can copy and give it to this command which calls a method on that thing this is very not you know not something i would do but if you look at this is called a simple coin um, contract that i have deployed here so just to quick have a look at this is a solidity contract which gives the owner 1000 coins of this thing and then it has a few methods like sending and getting a balance getting a balance as a view and if I look at the signatures, then get balances this F A B to something, and that's what we've been calling here. But this is, and actually, this thing that it returned is a hexadecimal encoding. If you decode it, it's it says ten thousand. But this is not very user friendly. So we have this other method called other thing, other option to just run it programmatically. So here it says 10,000 and then and uh, you can see that these are the JSON things that come and go from the actual tender mintar PC because that's what we're talking to and, and we're decoding it. And just to have a quick look at, at what this looks like. So, so this this example is, is like a script where you can with static typing interact with your family contract. So uh, this is the this is the contract. I'm gonna actually deploy it again in this script. Uh, and if the Solidity compiled to me this ABI, so with that I can create. This is not done by me. This is another library, but I'm just saying that this is a nicer way of working with this. So we can create a simple coin interface, and then we can say that I'm just gonna connect to the Fenderment, well, actually Tenderment, but with, with my client. I'm going to read my secret key, which is um, Alice is in this example. I'm going to check out. I'm going to query what Alice is nonce is so we can resume and send the next transaction so that it checks out. Create a message factory, bind it to the client, and then run this thing. And then running it means that I have a client who can, I, which I can now use to send transactions, send these ABCI queries, which I read only things, and do. What is a call, which is a trans, it looks exactly like a transaction, but it doesn't consume money for, you know, uh, everybody familiar with the Ethereum call knows this, that if you have this view, like a pure view that doesn't need gas, but we can use gas if we want. So in this, in this example, we make actually two calls to the contract. One is in transaction and the other one is not in transaction so the not in transaction just queries the low the low the node that you're connected to but you have to trust it or you have to run it with a few samples and they might not even let you do this because it it it's um you know, it might be your own node that you're querying but it, it does put a load on them or you do this transaction in which case you don't have to trust them but there's going to be a quorum because everybody runs it and you have to pay for it and it's just um says that these are the same so that's the test here and then uh, there are these library methods that are available now to, to query the state and it gives you back something that is uh, an actual you know statically typed actor state or deployed a contract with a method that is specific to fvm and gives you back the the return so you can read the addresses from it or, or and this is where the static typing comes in if you want to get the balance then you can create a contract and call it and it knows that this is going to return 
a big int that it can pass and you don't have to worry about the hexadecimal ABI encoded stuff yourself. So yeah, that's just as an example of either calling or invoking a trans uh, yeah, a transaction. So it has the same almost exact parameters except with the call you can specify where on the blockchain you should run this. Yeah, and um the way we see this used is is that if you run a subnet then you might want to modify the FVM actually. So some of our some of the people interested in this want to run their own syscalls, like they want to actually connect to an external database and maintain that. So more like a, a Cosmos application where you do whatever you want and not restricted to what the Lotus version of the FVM lets you do. And like you can't at the moment deploy user defined WASM contracts there. Whereas here you can just start your own subnet with the extra wasm like extra built-ins that you want to run and, and then that's up to you what what they do and how they do it it's a more lightweight option to explore the fm and sorry if i went over time but thank you very much for listening awesome thank you so much akash um and then we have brenda with an intro to lassie so hello everyone, my name is Brenda. I'm a product manager on the Bedrock team. Um, and uh, so shout out to my fellow Bedrockers here, Lauren, DBD, and Yvonne. Um, so today I'm gonna share a bit about Lassie, which is a new retrieval client that um, some folks on the team, Hannah, Rod, and Kyle started building out back in January. So it's been a couple of months, but um, yeah, really excited to share kind of the progress that's been made and how it works and how you can talk to um, other folks in the ecosystem about it. So let's get started. Um, so uh, I don't know how you guys kind of feel when you talk about Falcon and IPFS, but I think sometimes when I share about it to whether it's clients or to just my friends or my family, um, you know, it's kind of technically confusing for them. And so for them, you know, maybe you're a client or maybe you're like a consumer and you're like, Hey, you know, Falcon and IPFS are pretty cool, but how do I actually know where my data is? And if I have stored on a storage provider on Filecoin, how do I know which one has it? Um, do I have to like track all these things down and remember it myself? So what if I'm a client and I don't actually know where my data is or which storage provider has it? And this is where we're introducing Lassie, um, which is a retrieval client that will actually find and fetch your CIDs over the best protocols available on both IPFS and Filecoin. So just to show a little bit more about how it works with this nifty diagram, um, shout out to Lauren. So basically um, on the client side, you have the CLI tool, um, Lassie, and essentially how it works right now is that you give it a CID. In this case, there is um, this example CID here, B-A-F-Y, you know, dot, 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 dot. Um, you just ask Lassie, hey, I want to fetch this CID. Lassie will actually go and query the IPNI, the interplanetary network indexer that um, Yvonne shared a bit about earlier. And how are they serving it? So IPNI will come back with um, this group of providers, both IPFS and Filecoin providers, and essentially um, like which providers they are and what protocols they're serving it over. And so Lassie will actually go and ask these different providers, hey, like, please provide me this CID. And it will actually race these different um, providers and whoever returns the fastest, um, that's where we get your data from. So there's a couple of different Lassie modes that um, you can use it in. Um, the first one being the most straightforward, which is a CLI. You basically download um, Lassie and you basically run this base, very simple command, Lassie fetch, and then you insert your CID and it will return you a um, your CID in um, car file format. So that's the CLI. You can also use the Go client library, which can be integrated directly into your Go app. Um, there's also an HTTP daemon for integration into non-Go apps. And we'll um, talk about a little bit more about this later. Um, some pretty neat Lassie features. Um, it's very lightweight, but essentially the big, the big one, it retrieves seamlessly from both Filecoin and IPFS for you. Um, what it does, it will find the content for you, or you can also specify where you want to get the content if you know where your provider is and how to reach it. Um, 
It also, it basically queries all these providers in parallel and returns the data to you from the fastest source, as I explained earlier. Um, and then optionally, you can see digital progress information. So there's a snippet here that kind of shows, hey, um, the step-by-step -step of what's happening, you're fetching the CID, it queries the indexer for the CID. Um, here's the candidates that I found from the indexer and it's querying all of them. Um, and it kind of lists the progress of what's happening. So you can see where your request is. Um, so lastly, also fetches and guards your data. So basically um, all data that Lassie returns to you is in car format, so it's verified data. Um, so you, you know that when you receive it, it's exactly what you asked for. Um, so basically a data provider cannot provide you with false data or give you something that is actually completely different from um, what you had asked for from your CID. Um, and then basically the, the output that Lassie has gives you everything you need to verify the content as well. So Lassie, cute, but also it fetches and it guards for you. So really quickly, I wanted to share where Lassie is being used today in addition to just you know, individual um, like end users such as myself or um, other folks working at this company using Lassie and CLI. But actually, um, Saturn, a decentralized CDN, which many of you guys probably have heard about, um, essentially it cache misses to Falcon and IPFS, and it's doing this via Lassie. So um, if you go to Saturn and you ask for a particular CID, um, and maybe the Saturn doesn't, um, Saturn cache nodes don't have this, it'll actually go and um, use Lassie and ask for this content from IPFS and Filecoin. And so it's being used today, um, which is really neat. Uh, and you can see just some basic stats that I pulled earlier today. Um, retrievals both to Filecoin and IPFS are flowing. So if anyone kind of claims to you that, hey, like retrievals are broken or retrievals aren't working. They actually are working. And so you can see here that a portion of IPFS IO traffic right now is being sent to both storage providers and IPFS nodes. And basically, um, yeah, over like 113 million retrievals, successful retrievals on both Filecoin and IPFS. This is just over um, a weekly seven-day period. And out of that, we know for sure there's at least um, 147 plus thousand successful retrievals from um, over 63 unique storage providers. And um, yeah, possibly more because the way that we're separating this right now is um, purely based on GraphSync, which is a retrieval protocol um, versus BitSwap. And actually storage providers are also um, serving retrievals over BitSwap. So it could be, could be more than, could be more than um, this number, but it's it's hard to just differentiate that random our metrics. Um, so yeah, really exciting. This is just from like one project, the Saturn um, Brea project that's kind of in ramping and test mode right now. So just want to encourage everyone to try out Lassie, give us feedback, um, have some links in this deck where you can have a base. You can go see basic Lassie, basic Lassie tutorial. Um, we have a GitHub that has more detailed information as well as HTTP spec. And if you have any questions, find us on um, Retrieval Help. And I did want to show you how easy it is to use. So for the purpose of this demo, very simple. I just um, downloaded like Lassie and I am running Lassie fetch. Um, I provide this CID. Um, and essentially what I'm doing um, here is I also downloaded the car tooling and FFmpeg tooling. Um, I'm basically extracting the car file. So, um, and then I'm going to play it over uh, FF play. And this video um, is basically a video that one of our teammates, Rod, had uploaded um, to Web3 Storage. And so let's see what happens. Oh, it's on the screen. But here's a video playing. Very simple and easy to use. So um, yeah, let me know if you try it out. Find us on Retrieval Help if you have any questions. And that's it for me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brenda. That was great. So everyone knows where you can find them. Just wanted to thank everyone for attending Mother of All Demo Days. Um, thank you to all the presenters. Great job. Um, and that was for those who are interested in uh, presenting their demo, our next one will be June 15th. Um, and for anybody who missed it and wants to share with their teams, uh, the recording will be up by the end of the day. Um, but yeah, thank you again, everyone. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks, George.